So first, let me uh, introduce uh, protein ubiquitization. I'm sure you all know that this is a very prominent and very important post-translational protein modification in the cell. Uh, it is uh, conserved in all eukaryotes and it is essential for cell viability. It consists of the uh, attachment of an anti-protein, ubiquitin, it's 76 amino acid protein, to uh, lysine residues of substrate proteins. And uh, this modification um, has many functions, but the best studied function of uh, protein ubiquitination is its role in the so-called uh, ubiquitin proteasome system. In this system, uh, ubiquitin serves as a recognition signal for this large protein complex, the proteasome, and the proteasome is going to uh, degrade ubiquitinated protein into small peptide. So ubiquitin proteasome system has two main functions in the cell. Uh, it is involved in uh, quality control to eliminate non-functional proteins. And the second main function is the regulation of cellular processes for uh, the degradation and the inactivation of key uh, cellular uh, proteins. So just to give a bit more information on uh, quality control, actually most of the ubiquitination events that occur in the cell at any given time come from uh, quality control uh, ubiquitination events. Uh, there are many uh, molecular mechanisms uh, for quality control that lead to ubiquitination and proteasomal degradation. One of the most uh, studied one is ERAD, ER associated protein degradation, which is involved in the quality control of uh, secreted and membrane proteins. And I think next week you're actually going to have uh, a seminar on, on ERAD. Uh, then another mechanism that leads to massive ubiquitination and proteasome degradation is actually co-translational protein quality control. Um, many scientists don't realize this, but up, it's estimated that up to 30% of the newly translated protein are actually mistranslated and uh, degraded in a proteasome dependent manner. And as well, uh, misfolded or damaged protein can be recognized in the cell, ubiquitated and degraded by the proteasome. So as you can very easily imagine, any unbalance in those processes can have dramatic effect in the cell and lead to the uh, diseases. This is in particular the case for uh, neurodegenerative disorders. And next week, the talk about ERAD is going to explain, I think, its role in the involvement, involvement of uh, Huntington disease. So quality control is very important. And uh, as I said, uh, accounts for most of the ubiquitination events that occur in the cell. <coughs> the regulation of cellular processes accounts for less ubiquitination events, but is not less important. Uh, actually, uh, most of the cellular processes, if not all of the cellular processes, are regulated through uh, ubiquitination and proteasomal dependent degradation. Uh, key examples are, for instance, cell cycle progression, uh, many signaling events, uh, DNA transcription, and, for instance, uh, response to DNA damage, we were discussing this uh, with Carlo uh, a moment ago. So again, uh, any imbalance in those processes can uh, lead to diseases, and cancer are probably the most prominent diseases that are linked to uh, imbalance in protein ubiquitination events. So now, I don't want you to believe that um, all what ubiquitination does in the cell is uh, uh, lead to protein degradation. Uh, ubiquitation has many other functions in the cell. It's a very versatile uh, post-translational protein modification. And this is due to the fact that uh, ubiquitin itself has lysines that are uh, exposed at its surface and can be modified by uh, another uh, ubiquitin moiety. And this uh, subsequent ubiquitination leads to the formation of ubiquitin chains on the substrate. Actually, uh, there are seven lysines on the surface of ubiquitin that can be uh, modified by uh, ubiquitin moieties, K6, K11, K27, K29, K33, K48, and K63. And in mammalian cells, the end terminus of ubiquitin can also be modified. So this creates eight different types of ubiquitin, ubiquitin linkages that can serve for the assembly of linear, mixed, or branch uh, ubiquitin chains. So this is a huge variety of different types of ubiquitin chains that can be assembled. And since the different ubiquitin chains adopt different structure, for instance, I show you here K6 
K48 ubiquity chains uh, adopt a compact structure, while K63 ubiquity chains adopt a linear structure. Those different structures are recognized by different effectors in the cell and lead to different uh, outcomes. For instance, it is now known that K11 and K48 link chains are actually the chains that serve for proteasomal degradation, while uh, linear and K63 chains have uh, non-degradative functions that are involved in nf kappa -B signaling or uh, the DNA damage response functions for K63 chains. So this uh, huge versatility of protein ubiquitylation uh, poses a number of challenges for uh, researchers. Of course, we want to know, like anybody who is studying uh, post-translational post modification, we want to know all the proteins that are modified in the cell by ubiquitin. We want to know what is the ubiquitinome, but we don't not only want to know what is the ubiquitinome, we don't know for each protein which is modified by ubiquitin, we want to identify the type of ubiquitination. Is this mono ubiquitinated? Is this poly ubiquitinated by K48 link chains, by K63 chains? Are the chains branch? Are the chain linear? Etc. Of course, we also want to know how the specificity of the ubiquitination in controlled in the cell. Uh, this means that we need to identify the enzyme that assembles a different type of modification. We need to identify how they are regulated in a spatiotemporal manner. And um, we also need to understand uh, how the isopeptidases that reverse ubiquitination are uh, regulating uh, the specificity of ubiquitination because they can edit ubiquitin chains. And uh, last, we also need to understand how the different ubiquitination events are interpreted by the cells. And this needs the identification of uh, ubiquitin binding domains proteins that can read the different type of ubiquitination and lead to different uh, functional outputs. So, sorry. So my presentation today is going to be related to this point here. Uh, we are also addressing other parts of, the, of, the, of other type of question, but uh, the, the presentation I'm going to do, to do today is linked to this part and is linked to um, the mechanism of ubiquitylation and of its uh, spatial temporal regulation. So I need to give you a bit more information on the mechanism of uh, protein ubiquitylation. And contrary to other uh, post-translational modifications such as phosphorylation, uh, ubiquitylation does not happen in a single step. For instance, in phosphorylation, there is a simple, single uh, catalysis step where the kinase takes a phosphate from the ATP and transfers it to the phosphate. In the case of ubiquitylation, the modification of the substrate involves three subsequent catalytic steps, where ubiquitin in blue here first needs to be activated in the presence of ATP uh, and conjugated to a Ni1 activating conjugating enzyme. It's conjugated to a cysteine in its uh, catalytic site, uh, forming a thioester linkage. Then ubiquitin is transferred to the E2, still to the cysteine of the catalytic site. It's again a thioester linkage. And then, so the E2 is a, called the ubiquitin conjugating enzyme. And then the ubiquitin ligase recognizes specific substrates and allows the transfer of the ubiquitin activated ubiquitin from the conjugating enzyme to the substrate. So the E3 and the E2 are very important enzymes in ubiquitylation. The E3 is the enzyme that directs the specificity of, uh, of, of the modification of the substrate. It's the one enzyme that recognizes the substrate. And the E3 and the E2 are responsible for the specificity of the modification, what type of ubiquitylation is going to uh, be used to modify a given substrate. So it is very important for each substrate, uh, which is ubiquity in the cell, to understand what are the E3 and the E2 that are modifying this substrate. So um, those enzymes are organized in a hierarchical uh, manner. Uh, in human or yeast cells, there are a few uh, E1, ubiquity activating enzyme, two and one, respectively. Uh, a couple of E2s. So 11 ubiquitin uh, conjugating enzyme in, in yeast and about uh, 30 to 40 in human cells. And then a uh, larger number of E3s. We have about 60 in yeast and there are more than 300 uh, unique protein, unique uh, ubiquitin enzyme uh, in yeast, uh, in uh, human cells, sorry. 
So we know some of the uh, couples, some of the pairs that function together in the cell. We know for some IFRIs that they can work with one specific E2 or with different E2s. But in many instances, we don't know the pairs of enzymes that function in the cell. And this is uh, the question that I want to address uh, with you today. So we clearly need uh, reliable methods to identify physiological E2, E3 pairs. Uh, and we need methods to reveal when and where they are functioning in the cell. So when I was a postdoc, I was uh, at the ETH, I was already asking this kind of question. And I was asking this question in a manner that I thought was quite um, unsatisfactory, at least to me. And one, I want to show you one of the experiments that I was doing at that time. So in that case, I was uh, expressing, I was looking at uh, the interaction of three different ubiquitin ligases, HRT1, SSL1, and TFP3, it doesn't really matter, uh, to a different uh, conjugating enzyme. And what I did is that I prepared a total yeast extract where those enzymes were tagged, and I passed those extracts over uh, glutathione beads where, to which uh, different uh, E2s, UBC12, UBC4, and RAT6 were bound. And we were looking at what, uh, where was E3 uh, retained. So for instance, in the case of HRT1, you can see that HRT1 was specifically retained by UBC12 and UBC4. Uh, SSL1, in contrast, was retained uh, specifically uh, by UBC4. So this uh, is a way to know uh, what are the E2s with which a given uh, E3 uh, specifically interact with. But the time scale of this experiment um, is very long. Uh, it takes uh, several minutes to do, to do the binding and to do the washes and has nothing to do with the time scale at which the E2 and the E3 interact in the cell when they do their real uh, ubiquitination job. Uh, the time scale of ubiquitination is milliseconds in the cell. So here we are assessing interactions that have, in my opinion, uh, nothing to do with the interaction that's actually really uh, happening in the cell. So those inter experiments were interesting, <coughs> but I'm, uh, as I said, quite frustrating to me because I think uh, they were not telling us too much about what's happening in the cell. So I thought it would be a more interesting, or at least uh, complementary, to try to identify what are the interactions that are really uh, happening in the cell. And uh, because of my uh, 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 formation at the, at, the, at the EMBL before doing my PhD, I thought that perhaps we could try to use methods that have been developed to assay protein proteinization uh, in conditions that are close to physiological, physiological conditions in living cells. So here are three methods that are uh, traditionally used to assay protein-protein uh, interaction in living cells. I'm sure you know about at least some of those methods. FRET is a very common method that, uh, so for instance, resonance energy transfer, that assays the proximity of two uh, fluorophores in space, has uh, several advantages. If you do FRET uh, properly, you can have uh, quantitative measurements of the interaction. However, it has a very uh, strong limitation uh, threat is extremely sensitive to the distance between the two fluorophores, and is therefore, uh, therefore it requires lots of optimization <coughs> to uh, identify the interaction, to be able to detect the interaction between two pairs, and is not very suitable to assess uh, lots of interactions with different uh, partners. For instance, cross-correlation spectroscopy is another very uh, interesting method. Uh, again, you can have quantitative uh, measurements. You can know very precisely of the, the concentration of the, of the interacting partners. Um, and uh, compared to FRED, has an advantage that three or four can be far apart. Uh, however, it has currently a detection limit for low abundant complexes, and it is a rather difficult method to use uh, in uh, high throughput or at least medium throughput experiments. And protein complementation assays are also very interesting assays. Uh, in the type of assays, what you do is that uh, you uh, tag the protein interface with complementary fragment of a reporter protein. 
and when the re complementary fragments are brought into close proximity, then you have uh, enzyme activity, for instance. So this can reveal, this can, has been used to reveal weak interaction. In some cases, it has been shown to be highly sensitive and can be used in quite high throughput manner. So limitation that has qualitative measurements. You cannot have uh, absolute uh, quantitative measurement of the concentration in general. Uh, tags must come into close proximity uh, to be able to have the interaction. Also, um, it's less sensitive than threat, so it's better than threat in this respect. And some of the complementation assays that have been used uh, have the weakness that they can lead to self-association of the two pairs and thus lead to false positive uh, report, which is a, a big limitation. So uh, we were thinking of using those different uh, type of assays to assay E2, E3 interaction in living yeast. And we uh, started with different approaches, but in the end, we uh, decided to use uh, protein complementation. And the protein complementation assay that we decided to use is uh, bimolecular fluorescence complementation. So what we do in this assay is that we tag the protein of interest here in E3 and in E2 with complementary fragment of a venous fluorescent protein. So the N-terminal fragment, the N, or the C-terminal fragment. When the protein of interest, the so E2 and E3, interact, they bring into pro close proximity the two fragments that can refold into a, a native uh, fluorescent protein that will eventually become fluorescent and report for the interaction that happened between the E2 and the E3. So we decided to use this uh, in yeast, and the advantage is that uh, we can, uh, like this, assay the interaction between uh, two proteins uh, at their endogenous uh, localization. Uh, in yeast, we can control the concentration of the, of the, of the protein, so we are assess the interaction at the real concentration, or at least close to the real concentration. Um, we preserve, uh, when E3, for instance, are in protein complexes, we preserve the, the, the interacting partners, we preserve the fact that the E2 can be uh, conjugated with ubiquitin, and this has been shown to be able to influence the capacity to interact with E3, and we preserve any type of regulation that can happen. So because this has never been used before uh, to assay uh, E2 E3 interaction, we first decided to test whether this could be uh, suitable using a well-known E3 E2 pair, which is UFD4, UBC4. And, both, and we chose this, this, this pair because both proteins are uh, relatively abundant in yeast, as you can see in those images that are taken from the uh, SACOMESS genome database. <coughs> so we tagged uh, uh, under the UFD4 uh, with a fragment of Venus, and UBC4, the fragment of Venus, we replaced the endogenous genes with those tagged forms, and then we assayed the interaction. So if I conclude on this part, uh, this shows that uh, indeed bimolecular fluorescence complementation enables to specifically detect the interaction of an E2 with an E3 at conditions that are near to physiological conditions. And uh, furthermore, that BIFC can be used to study the mechanism of the interaction since we have information that uh, UFD4, UBC4 interacts not only with this canonical E3 interaction surface, but also with this backside. And this uh, decided us to uh, perform a screen to systematically assay E2 E3 interaction in yeast. So what we did, we constructed uh, yeast strains where all the 11 uh, ubiquitinating conjugating enzymes were tagged with a C-terminal fragment of Venus. Uh, again, so we are tagging now the endogenous proteins. So uh, we can see uh, the uh, with an anti-GFP antibody, uh, the abundance of the different E2s, and you can see that some E2s are much more expressed in the condition that we're using than others. So, for instance, RAT6 is barely detectable here on this Western, and uh, UBC11 is actually not at all detectable. We could not detect even when we uh, exposed more of the Western, although it is expressed. So we have the endogenous level of expression, or at least close to endogenous, and uh, this we can check by using uh, antibodies against uh, the endogenous protein, and we ha have blots with two uh, E2s, one blot with RAT6 and one blot with UBC6. And you can see here that in the cell we have only uh, tagged RAT6 or tagged uh, UBC6. There's no more uh, untagged versions of the proteins. 
and we explore the ex expressed levels that are as close as we can uh, to underneath levels. Also, we observe that quite often it is reduced, and this is probably due to the fact that the tag is somehow destabilizing the protein. <coughs> so uh, we then constructed uh, yeast strains where we had uh, tagged IFRIS, and we were lucky uh, that the company, Bionir, had actually uh, released a fusion libra a library with uh, yeast tagged to VN. So we bought this, with this library and we took 55 strains with E3s fused to the fused citamly to the uh, N-terminal fragment of Venus. But some E3s uh, have the E2 interaction surface, which is at the N-terminus. So we also decided to construct strains that are fused N-terminally to VN. So we had constructed eight strains like this. Uh, two of them were not tagged, were not present in, in, in those 55 strains. So in total, uh, we have uh, 57 different E3s that are tagged and 63 different strains because some strains have both, some E3s are tagged both N and C terminally. <coughs> we then arrayed those strains, the E2s and the E3 strains, in 96 well plates, and we cross them systematically with uh, selection markers. Uh, to select uh, haploid strains that have expressing a, a single combination of an E2 and an E3. So in total, we have uh, something like 700 strains. And we uh, then image those strains uh, using this workflow. So the strains are in 96 well played uh, with a glass cover slip under the bottom. We uh, made autofocus uh, to be able to find the cells. We image four fields for each well, looks like this. And then we process images uh, through image processing. So we do the segmentation as I explained before, background, background subtraction, quality control, and signal standardization. And we obtain uh, uh, a quantification like this. So we are still in the process of uh, analyzing our results. Uh, so I can give you some preliminary uh, estimation that are not final numbers. Um, out of the 700 strains, we detected something like uh, 100 uh, combinations that produced a detectable biopsy signal. So this is about 15% of the different combinations that we tested. Uh, what I should say is that many of these interactions had not been described before in literature. So there are putative new e 2 e interactions. Uh, and I should also say that some published interactions are not detected, which is expected. So uh, we do not claim that uh, we are uh, finding all the possible two different interactions. Um, if we look at this data from the E2 side, all E2s that we had uh, produce a detectable uh, biopsy signal with at least one E3. Uh, UBC1 and UBC13 are the two E2s that uh, produce uh, biopsy signal with most E3s. Uh, and there, has, there were some E2s like UBC7 and UBC11 that seem to be very specific and that interact with only one or two uh, E3s. And if we look at the data from the E3 side, we had got interaction with about 60% of the E3s. 80% uh, of those E3s that interact uh, produce a signal with more than one E2. Uh, and uh, what's quite interesting is that the uh, uh, first and signal informs us on the localization of the E2 uh, E3 pair. So uh, to conclude, I have tried to show you that uh, a bimolecular first and combination is a highly sensitive and uh, specific assay to detect protein-protein interaction. Uh, in our case, E2 E3 interactions, and the specificity at least is maintained uh, as long as the two proteins are not uh, too strongly expressed in the cell, uh, which is our case because we attack our protein endogenously. Uh, BIFC enables to detect new putative E2 E3 pairs, and this is something that we are now trying to uh, demonstrate uh, by uh, having uh, more uh, assays to really show that the uh, new pairs that we are identifying are actually indeed functioning in the cell. It can be used to study the mechanism of interaction and its regulation. I've just shown you that you have UBC4 interacts with both its uh, traditional canonical interaction surface, but also with its backside, with UFD4. It can be used to systematically assay to E3 interaction network uh, in living cells. 
So I think it would be very interesting now to uh, repeat the experiment that we've performed in different conditions, for instance, upon DNA damage, to see how the network is remodeled uh, upon different stresses. And uh, very importantly, uh, the fluorescence gives us information on the localization of the interaction that gives us clues about possible functions. With this, I would like to thank uh, the people actually involved in this project. So this is performed at the IGDR uh, in Rennes in the team, in the lab of Claude Prigent, who is actually the director of the institute. And uh, this project is a PhD project of Eva Boissac. She's getting help by uh, Gaël Ledé. And uh, Agatha Sena is a postdoc who is working on a, a different project which involves the identification of ubiquitin protein in yeast. And those are the people who are funding us. Thanks very much for your attention.